It is the college football playoff. It's the first time ever the Big Ten has gotten two in, though it's the third straight season that one conference has had two representatives in the playoff. And, of course, the Big Ten would love to follow in the footsteps of the SEC, which got both its semifinalists through to the title game a year ago. We're going to get to the matchups here in a bit and give you some keys for each one of the games. But I want to talk about each one of the Big Ten teams first. So what stands out to you about Michigan and its perfect run to this point, Coach? Well, a lot of the questions that we all talked about about halfway through the season, I think Michigan has answered those questions. Number one, could we throw the football down the field, right, with J.J.? And I think they answered that that they are capable of doing that. They have improved at doing that. And the second thing to me, okay, with Blake Corum out, it, are they going to abandon the run? Are they going to change the run? And the way Edwards came in and played, uh, nothing has really changed. You, you hate, I mean, it has because we know what a great player that, that Blake is, but they stayed with their same philosophy, and the defense has been consistent. Yeah, and I, I think kind of the way that you framed it, a perfect run for Michigan up to this point. It is extremely difficult to go 13-0 through the regular season when you're conference championship. And Jim Harbaugh even said, it's hard for me to fix my mouth to, to say 13-0. But it shows exactly what this team is. And, and they had some battles in the offseason they had to deal with. You know, coaches maybe looking at the NFL. He regroups those guys. They don't even think about it. You've got the quarterback situation they have to sift through. And it always felt like this was a very steady build for Michigan throughout the year. It seemed like they had their identity and they just kept getting better at what they did. Now, you mentioned their evolution. And J.J. McCarthy, it seems like they're allowing him to be more of the creator and the playmaker out there. And you saw some of the plays that he extended in the Big Ten championship game. I think that's going to take them a long way through this playoff run. You mentioned the change at running back, but it's really been the same identity on the ground. This team continues to respond, and I look at their defense even for that to where between the 20s, they might give up some yards, get them down that red zone, it's game over. That defense tightens all the way up, and that's a mark of a team that is poised to win a championship is they never flinch in the face of adversity. You know, you brought up a good point. You know, you talk about J.J. extending plays. And you always look at quarterbacks because he's athletic. We've seen him run. We know he can tuck it and go, take it the distance. But Russell Wilson, when he was at Wisconsin and then obviously his early days in the pros, when Russell would extend plays, he was always extending looking to throw. He wasn't extending looking to run, which some quarterbacks do. Yeah. And I think that's a real positive trait that we're seeing right now. And we certainly saw that in the Big Ten Championship game. It's really impressive when you're standing on the sidelines and you watch him, the degree to which he keeps his eyes Absolutely. downfield. Every once in a while throws one that, that you wish he wouldn't, but a lot less it's frequently a, he, than you would think. And you'll yeah. take that with yes. a guy like J.J. too no because doubt. of the top end that he can give you. Making plays. Like, you'll let them get one every once in a while. Yes. Yeah. Right, how about this matchup with the Horned Frogs? What do you see, Joshua? Well, it's, it's, this is an interesting one because I think the conversation about Michigan has been their physicality, which is true about this team. Every rep, they want to make sure that they can be the more dominant team. And you look at TCU coming from the Big 12. He asks a question about can they be physical? It is a team that is uh, – their identity starts with running the football offensively, and they've got some weapons that I'll talk about in a sec, but they want to make sure that's a part of their game plan, whether it's really working or not. So that's a physical mentality. I look at their defense, and folks will ask the questions there, can you stop Michigan's run? It's a defensive line that plays with three down linemen, and then sometimes they roll the backers up, sometimes they keep them off the ball. But I was watching the Texas game, and during the first drive, Texas runs a counter. And you want to talk about physicality. The way that TCU set the edge, the edge defender ran right through the tight end, like literally ran through him, the guy's laying on his back. Yep. right? So they're going to see a team that wants to bring physicality as well, which I'm excited about. Now, this TCU offense, where they kind of separate to me, we know what Max Duggan is as a quarterback. Like He's a guy that has... Um, a lot of conversation for all of the right reasons this year. He is electric. He's a gritty player. He's really willed them into some wins. Quentin Johnston at wide receiver, 6'4", 215. Yep. That guy is a weapon. And Duggan will just lob it up to him, and at 6'4", he'll go up and get it. I think that's the biggest matchup because we've seen – on the other side from Michigan, where their corner play has really elevated throughout the year. And I'm excited to see what this looks like. Yeah, you're right. You know, they, nobody, second most uh, plays over 50 yards in the country. I mean, uh, offense, I'll stay with them real quick. You know, 
TCU's offense is very similar in my mind when I watch them play to what Ohio State is. They want to get the big play, big play, big play. The difference in this team is defensively, they are they're, – they're not – you know, their average defense. They right. haven't been dominant. You know that, Rever. But the one thing, you know, keep in mind, Sonny Dykes, the head coach. I know Sonny very well. I knew his father. This guy's been a head coach at Cal. He's been a head coach at SMU. He's a heck of a football coach. So he's going to have his team prepared. And, uh, you know, it, it's good. Michigan is the more complete team. 100%. Offense, defense. Where TCU is a little bit. Offense heavy. To your point, 57th in the nation in scoring defense for TCU and so many close games, right? Eight of their wins by 10 or fewer points. By contrast, Michigan has two, and of course, they're undefeated. TCU's got a loss and eight wins by 10 or fewer points. But again, they figured out a way to win those, te- those games. I mean, I don't think there's any question this is a really good team that absolutely deserves to be there and absolutely can beat Michigan if they play their best and and Michigan doesn't play its best. What about Ohio State? Uh, The Buckeyes, very different story from Michigan, Coach. They needed a lot of help to get into this thing. As you said, you you had a sense they were going to get it, and they did. Now they've got this second lease on life, but none of the issues which arose in the Michigan game go away. It's different than having an offseason where you can say, well, we've addressed that. You can address it in the short term, but you can't address it. You can address it schematically. You can't address it personnel-wise. Maybe yeah, that's the best way to put and it. And I'm kind of focused on the defense a little, you know, with Ohio State, because a lot of their mistakes were fundamental mistakes. Mm-hmm. You know, what I mean, keeping mm-hmm. leverage. You know, who's going to turn the ball in? I mean, tackling was horrible in that game. I mean, these are fundamental things that that's where I would have my focus. And the good news is we're not playing this week, so we do have some time to work on that. Uh, the the challenge is uh, that that when when you're working on defensive backs getting tackling live, you got to do it live in right. practice because otherwise it's too late in the game. The real question mark is going to be: Does Jim Knowles want to adjust his scheme, or does he go back to fundamentals? And you know, be, so him and Ryan Day when they sit down, is he saying that we just tackled bad and we did bad fundamentals? Or is, he, or is Ryan Day saying, I don't like the scheme that we're doing. we got to change the scheme. That's the real thing that I got my eye on. Offensively, I, I don't see a whole lot changing. They know what they're going to do offensively. Defensively is, well, let's watch it close and see if they play man or if they play zone, if they pressure more, if they don't. Yeah, and it's, it's really interesting when you talk about fundamentals to address that point because – Um, When I was at Ohio State, Urban had bowl practices basically broken down into three phases. And the first two phases were fundamental uh, phases. Essentially, it was fundamental heavy because you're trying to get young players ready for the next year. But you're also trying to get back to what you did in training camp for the guys that are going to play in the game. Because like you said, if you're a defensive back, you're probably not hitting a ton during the season. You don't get to work on all of the little things. And now you get a little bit more runway to do that. And it leads into the second point about the scheme where I personally lean more toward it was a lack of fundamental execution than it was on the scheme because you could look at one of the long touchdowns where it was a cover two. So they're trying to give the corners a little bit of relief. They're not playing straight man. And in the back end, the safeties aren't doing the right thing. And they're just voiding zones to the point where there's no backstop to make a tackle. Uh, You mentioned the missed tackle on the man-to-man rep. I feel like that's an easy fix. And even in the run game, just guys jumping in and out of gaps. Maybe you pressure a little bit less just to make sure that you have more levels to your defense and more structure. But in terms of playing aggressive and getting in that man-to-man, I thought generally outside of a couple of plays, the defensive backs played pretty well. Now, the, the, the plays where they didn't really matter, and that's what you can't have, but that's where you get the time to go back to the fundamentals to work on that. They played aggressive all year. I don't really see them making a change. And playing aggressive got them to a, a, a top 10 defense right. heading into the Michigan game, too. Right. I mean, I do think that's the thing. It's not as if this has been broken all year. It is that they are coming off one bad game and one particularly bad half right. of football. And so teams play bad halves. I mean, you, you can figure your way out of that. Yeah. And, and we've seen historically, you know, to make it into this playoff and not be a conference champ, there are five teams previous to this year. Now, there are two this year, them and 
TCU, but two of the previous five won the national championship. So it absolutely can be done to, to get through and to do this. There's a reason they're there, Wani. They're a really good team, and they've proven it all year, but now they face the team that is, at least on paper, the best in the country. Right. When you guys won it, they were the four seed, correct? Right. They were, and, but a conference champ, yeah, but the four but seed. But they were still yes. the four seed, yes. and, you know, and I think that he can reference that, yeah, Ryan been, Day, right? Yeah, semifinal yeah, down south. We, 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 got, we, got, we played the number one seed then, and we did this, and, you know, it's uh, – so there's, there's a lot there, I think, that Ryan Day can – can use to kind of get us stirred up with his team. I bet you he's calling his buddy Urban right now saying, hey, coach, what would you do back in 14? Can you give me a little advice how to get this thing done? Yeah. All right, how do you get it done against Georgia? Well, this is a really balanced team. You start digging into the tape, and we know that it is a, a team that wants to be physical, and their identity is involved in, in running the football. But on average, they throw the ball more in a game than Ohio State does. So this is a team that has some really good balance to it. So – Ohio State's going to have their hands full, and especially with some of the personnel groupings that Georgia puts out there, they're going to throw tight ends in the game, then they're going to take them out and put a bunch of receivers in the game. And then they might even mix in uh, some different complementary personnel groupings with the running backs. So I think for Ohio State defensively, they have to be really aware of what the personnel is telling them about what the offense is going to be. Defensively for Georgia, they got nothing but freaks everywhere. Like, you flip on the tape, defensive line, freaks, linebacker, freaks, secondary, all freaks. Uh, but LSU kind of laid out a game plan that you can throw the football on Georgia, and that's why a lot of people believe that this is an intriguing matchup. Ohio State's got the wide receivers yep. that can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with any secondary. Their offensive line this year did a great job of protecting C.J. Stroud. So there are going to be opportunities to hit plays. It's just about Ohio State capitalizing on it. And I think for them, too, they need to look like Georgia in terms of their balance. I think Ohio State has to be committed to the run, whether they're getting the yardage they want or not. Yeah, you, you mentioned freaks on all level on defense. Really, offensively, you got a quarterback that's a Heisman candidate. Mm -hmm. you got the number one tight end in the country that's going to be a first-round draft guy's pick. Guy's great. Right? you got, you got running backs. I mean, they, they are, you know, top ten in scoring offense, top ten in scoring defense. There's not many holes in this thing. And, uh, you know, protect the football, uh, you know, Ohio State's going to just be very advantageous when they get the ball to take advantage of it and not give it to this team very often. Again, an undefeated team, only one game decided by single digits this year huh. for Georgia. So you talk about how overwhelming Michigan has been. Georgia has been overwhelming us too. There seems to be a pretty clear separation between one and two and three and four, but we've gone into this in previous years <laughs> thinking that it doesn't necessarily always play out that way one significant piece of news the Bucks are losing their offensive coordinator Kevin Wilson announced as the head coach of Tulsa last night he will stay on in Columbus through the Buckeyes playoff run spent six years as the coach of course in Indiana before stepping down in 2016 and has roots in Oklahoma he was the Sooners offensive coordinator two in the CFP nine games in all starting December 27th Wisconsin and Arizona to take on Oklahoma State Minnesota heads to Yankee Stadium, match up with Syracuse. Maryland gets an old conference rival, NC State in Charlotte. Iowa faces Kentucky in a bowl game for the second straight season. Penn State heading to Pasadena, fifth time in school history. That is January 2nd this year, same day Purdue heads to the Citrus Bowl. It's about LSU and Illinois in Tampa against Mississippi State. Uh, let's start with the Rose Bowl. It is a really good matchup, and to accentuate just how good a matchup it is, Joshua, two years from now, these would both be playoff teams. Yes. Both these teams would be in. In fact, Utah would be a top four seed sure. in Not the playoff. Sure. So it gives you a sense of what a good matchup it is. Uh, how do you think it plays out? Well, Utah, I know they're going to be excited to be back in the Rose Bowl. Last year was their first one, and now they're, they're back again. So it's going to be great. And as you look at this team, they want to be tough, they want to be physical, but they also play really disciplined football, which is a hallmark of a, a Whittingham coach team. So I'm excited to see what they look like from that regard. Cam Rising, their quarterback, is one of my favorite players to watch because he brings the guts and the grit. Um, and last year, he got hurt in the Rose Bowl, and I, I go out on the limb and say that if he played the full game, I'm not exactly sure Ohio State wins that one. That's how impactful he was. So Penn State's going to have their hands full with that. But I look at this Penn State team. Defense got better all year long. It seems like their offense really started to click, specifically the run game that we had questions about. And I look at them probably as the team that was the most impressive toward the end of the year yep. out of the Big Ten Conference, just the way that they were able to go out, really control and dominate football games. So this is going to be a big one for them just in terms of their program. And it's also a great stage and spotlight 
for some of those young players that played well all year. Get you a taste of a yep. New Year's Six Bowl game. Really set the tone for what the, the future could look like at Penn State. Yeah, you know, thank goodness that, that uh, Coach Franklin's got Sean Clifford, the quarterback, a veteran guy that's been around and done this type of stuff because there's a lot of young players, and that's, I mean, I coached in the bowl game, in the Rose Bowl when I was at USC. You know, it's as good as any. Trust me on that. So you can have a good time out there. And I'll tell you what, this game, and I'm a big fan of Whittingham's, you know, I, I know this team well, Utah. And this, for Penn State, this is going to be the physicality of Michigan, okay? This is going to be kind of like a Michigan game for them because they are balanced. You know, they're about 250 throwing, 225 running. Utah is on offense. And defensively, they're as good as anybody. I mean, eighth in the country in sacks, ninth in the country in takeaways, mm -hmm. lead the, the Pac-12 Pac in most categories defensively. This is going to be a physical game. The closest thing I think that Utah is is Michigan, in my mind. And, and, and to even hammer that point home more, I think Michigan is a great fundamental team, and that's what Utah did, and that's what really got them over yep. the hump against USC in their conference championship game is they were just the better fundamental team as well. They made tackles when they needed to. Offensively, they protected the football. They broke tackles when they needed to. Like, this is a team that's not going to back down, and they're going to rise up to every challenge. This was always the team you did not want to face in bowl right. games. Right. Right. Now, Whitting have an unbelievable run going. They won 14 to 15. Now, since then, they have lost three in a row, including that game you alluded to, the wild one with Ohio State a year ago. What about Purdue? Tough matchup with an LSU team that had some really big moments this year. Both these teams losing in their conference championship game is a great reward for Purdue for sure. Absolutely. And, you know, Jeff Brom's just going to have to be disciplined in this game because he's going to be watching the tape. LSU, what, one sack in the last three games. So he's not going to see a lot of pressure. And Jeff is going to be so tempted to throw the ball 60 times. So hopefully he comes out and he's balanced, you know, and they run the ball and they'll get their shots. I mean, you know, both these teams really want to throw the ball for the most part. That's where they've had their success. Uh, it, it is strange that LSU has not been able to get to the quarterback. Sure. If that happens in this game, I really like Purdue. Yeah, and what's interesting about LSU to me is when you really start to break down both the tape and the statistics about this team, they're, they're a very good football team. They're not really great at anything. And as a head coach, you probably sit there and now you say, okay, we can find edges in this game because they don't really excel at one specific thing. And we know when Jeff Brom finds an edge, whether that's offensively or defensively, he will take advantage of it. Yeah. I mean, this guy is maniacal when it comes to finding the thing that he can expose in a good football team. So I'm excited to see what he, think that, what he thinks that thing is. I made one note, what team beats themselves? You know, because LSU with the freshman quarterback, they've done that, like you said. And we know when Purdue's lost, it's been Purdue, right? We have certainly seen that this year. A little bit less lately. Yeah. But early in the year, that was a, a major Purdue affliction. Uh, what do you make of Mississippi State and <laughs> Illinois in Tampa? Mike Leach, we know he's going to throw it all over the place. Illinois has got the outstanding secondary and really great defense overall. So this feels like... One of those strength versus strength games, Wani. It, it does, you know, and, and Air Raid, Mike Leach, you know, going back to his Texas Tech days all along. You know, and I looked this up just to see, and they're running the ball a little over 25% of the time, which, you know, for Mike Leach, right, that's a lot. <laughs> yeah. But they do have. Round and pound for Mike Leach. <laughs> yeah, but they got a quarterback. This Will Rogers guy, mm -hmm. you know, 35 touchdowns and only seven interceptions. So they are throwing the ball. You're 100% river. All what Illinois has got to do, Illinois is the most complete team. They just got to go out and do what they do. You know, get Chase going. Tommy doesn't turn the ball over at quarterback. The way their defense plays, I, I really like. I, I think Illinois will be fine in this one. I think so, too. But the, the biggest thing that Mississippi State can do that worries me for Illinois is when they start going tempo offensively. Yep. Because Illinois is a team that wants to play aggressive coverage. Those guys are running out there with the wide receivers. And we know that air raid offense is built to attack space. So, in one regard, they're taking that space away. And they're going to make the throws uh, into hard windows, but on the other end, your guys are playing man-to-man -man or you're playing tight matchup zones, and they're going tempo. Those guys are going to be gassed. So I think defensively, you have to make sure you get off of the football field, and then like you've mentioned, on offense, this run game for Illinois is going to be as big as anything else because if you can yep. eat up the clock, you certainly help your defense in this matchup. That's going to be big. This is a Mississippi State team, as you guys said, that 
This just has a ton of weapons, nine players with at least 20 catches this year, and, and they've done great in games like this one this year, 6-1 and one against unranked opponents. Iowa and Kentucky, we've got quarterback uncertainty yeah. for the Hawkeyes, to say the least. Spencer Petras is out, Alex Padilla in the transfer portal, so it's already been a position where they've had issues this year, and now it seems like Joey Labus will be the guy against what is a really good defense, Joshua. It's a it's a stout defense, and that's going to be the challenge. And it's been the challenge for Iowa all year, though, so I'm sure that they're going to come up with answers. And um, a lot of it's probably going to center around what you can do with some of the tight end play. I know my guy Lachey out there is going to be poised to have another uh, career high in receptions, Rever, as you pointed out he was going to do a couple weeks ago. Oh, you, is, are you making a bold prediction right now? No, here? I'm not. Oh, you okay. made a bold that prediction, and I'm just following up on yeah, that. Yeah, I got another one right Yeah. Oh, Saturday, real, do you? Know. No, okay. So. All right. Okay. Um, and so that's going to be tough. I look at this Kentucky offense, and we don't know what Will Levis is going to do. I don't, you know, I doubt he probably plays in this football game. But uh, this is a more traditional offense, and Kentucky made a change at offensive coordinator. So does it evolve? I'm not sure, but they go out there and they'll give you two back sets. They'll give you 12 and 13 personnel with two or three tight ends in the football game. And to me, it seems like the game that Iowa would like to play because they have the personnel that can match up when offenses want to get big. So I'm excited to see exactly what that looks like. I think there are two very good defenses out there and two offenses that have had issues throughout the year. Which defense is going to maybe get the takeaway that changes the game? Yeah, you, you mentioned uh, Will Lewis, Levis. He, he could be the first quarterback taken in the draft they're talking about. So right. if he's not there, that's a huge void for Kentucky. The best thing that Iowa has going in this game, starting a new quarterback that's really never played, is Kurt Ferentz. Kurt Ferentz's win-loss record in bowl games, he has the blueprint to get – Iowa ready to play the best that they can play in a bowl game, and you know that that's going to happen. Can tie Joe Paterno, in fact, for the most wins in bowl games by a Big Ten head coach with a victory here. Guys, we're talking about no Will Levis potentially for Kentucky, even with Will Levis. Six of the last eight games they've yeah. scored 21 or fewer they, points. They haven't so. been good on no, that. That's, why they, that's, a, that's why they made the change at court. It's not been a, a, a great top, offensive Top 10 team. to start the year. Yeah, you know? no, it, uh, it has fallen off a bit.